most of the time these patterns are also drawn on the boards a bunch of different places. All of our bodies want to make these shapes. They're called the primary patterns for a reason. If we can't get into them, there's a strategic or a mechanical reason that that is not happening. Often a mobility reason, and, and we, can even, we can even work on that. When we look at a hinge, pretty universally, a hinge is going to have your shins as flat as you can, your back as flat as you can. And when we say brace, what we're talking about is fat, not tall, and before we move, not during. So three things that we'll ask of you this weekend is anytime you're moving, your head is neutral, we're bracing before we're moving, and anytime we're squirrely or unstable, add pauses, braced pauses, not breathing pauses. Pauses teach mechanics, pauses build strength. <coughs> Bracing is what allows you to stay safe. Breathing is something else entirely. And it's interesting uh, how mystified that can be there. I mean, and, and some of them are excellent, of course. There are weekend courses on the difference between the two. But to distill them extremely simply, if you're making a fat, hard belly while you're keeping a good, strong posture, you're strong here, you're stable. If the breath is up, you just remove this strong barrel, you just remove this belt from your midline. We want to keep that belt in our midline. So, so we're going to practice fat, not tall. Standing up the entire time and then keeping your head neutral. One thing that we've assessed over many years, probably a decade at this point, is when people start to get into deep water, their heads want to go everywhere other than where they should. And I mean, some seriously epic lifts have happened with people bridging their necks to the moon to get that thing up. But it is definitely not ideal. And universally, nine and a half times out of ten in here, when someone's spinal position is perfect, their lift is sounder, they're more consistent, and they almost always lift more weight. One thing I believe that contributes to that is when the lifts with the neck way up have happened, there's almost always something else going on. There is some manufactured stability happening. There's a belt, there's something else. That's the backup plan if your neck is off. If there's no backup plan, this becomes way more important. This becomes way more important. So when we look at a high anchored hinge, one of the reasons we do that is to prioritize this belly. Anyone else can come up here and help me too. When we hold on to something, hold on to it like you mean it. If you're going to hug it, hug it like you mean it. You use a grip that transfers to something else. We recommend some sort of like monkey paw rope grip. And the high anchored hinge is to make sure that you brace, understand what that feels like, and then we can find that pattern. always the first one that we go to because it teaches a lot. If you're not doing this and you have anything loaded up here, even if it's light, you're going to feel it. I'll show you exactly what will happen. We should identify that as fallible already because that's not even heavy and it's not even loaded. So you think about when it is heavy and it is loaded, if this isn't fat, the back isn't flat, we know that there's probably a hole in the boat. Out training it before we make it heavy is how we fix it. So for the high anchored hinge, let's grab a light medicine ball. We'll grab some of these things up here. Get a hold of that thing up high, close to your neck. Give it a good hard hug. And we're going to practice making that shape. Shins are vertical, backs are flat, bellies are fat. So, so marry yourself so you've got a rectangle. So a, a triangle is always going to be harder to lift from and harder to grab your knees off from. Make, make a rectangle lot in. One other kind of universal cue is well, we're just going to finish the lift or movement that we're in. If we're overhead, is this finished? No, this is terrible for a lot of reasons. But, but my fist should be over my heels. If I'm standing up from a deadlift, you should not be able to see any visible bend in my legs unless there's an injury present that's making that necessary. When you stand up, squeeze your butt, pull your hips forward, lock into place. With 20 pounds, everything in a perfect line, you should feel like you could be able to hold that for five hours. 
So, finish the lifts. Good. So now that we've figured out bracing, we'll figure out how to optimize it. The, the maester warning is something we put in play a long time ago. And it was, it was really just an assessment tool to get people into a safe, hard hinge. If you don't know where the hinge is, it's hard to replicate it every single time forever. So when we scoop these up, especially if you've never scooped it up before, we're going to lift carefully. Because it's heavy, but it's not heavy. So it's neat. And then what we're going to look for is points of contact. So this isn't going to create the best top position. It's not going to create nearly the powerful top position that this is. It doesn't matter. What we're looking for is head, shoulders, and hips attached to the base. And then the same low body position. When I know that I've overhinged is when I either lose contact with this thing, or my knees have to travel so far forward that I'm now going to cross the hinge. <laughs> so keep the shins as vertical as you possibly can. Keep the three points of contact. Make sure this thing's anchored to your head. I would consider this probably my lowest, safest hinge. This is still okay. This is still fine. I'm just not going to get quite as much power out of it. That's as far as I would go without losing contact. Form that same standard by pushing back and not standing up. So a lot of times finding those points of contact is, is, is really effective teaching this. You may not feel every single element of this hinge and all the other hinges, but you'll understand what it feels like to have your back actually flat because you can't trick this straight handle. Okay? So let's carefully find some reasonable weight maces, put them across, give four or five reps, and then pass the tool. So next, let's look at this kettlebell good morning. We're going to get into the exact same position. Why we like this, and, and how we've kind of retooled this, is the kettlebell with the good morning and us lives close to the body and at the bottom. It reminds us how important the upper back is in a deadlift. You've never seen a great deadlift or a great puller, a great hinger without at least a reasonably strong upper back. It doesn't exist. One way that we build that without simply just lifting heavy all the time is with things like a kettlebell good morning, same, same hinge, same exact pattern you guys just did. We'll stand it up in a deadlift. Keep it in really tight to our body and then only recess as much as we need to to get into that excellent bottom hinge position we just found. moment at the bottom and teach, teach ourselves about bracing hard stationary and then we'll stand back up with some force. You're bending that handle into a frown. You'll probably say that a lot over the weekend. What that helps people do is just make sure the upper back is doing the work it needs to do. If you're just grabbing it, there's a pretty decent chance that if you have any type of imbalance from the front to the back, this is going to take right over. So when you grab a hold of this thing, bend it as hard as you possibly can the entire time. It also allows us to do more work with less. If you're over-engaging the tool, you're getting an awful lot accomplished in every single rep versus maybe taking 20 reps to do what you could do in five if they were full effort. So we're putting every single piece of effort into every single rep and then ultimately doing less, accomplishing more. Unless training to attrition is truly the sport that you're in, that's how training transfers to things besides training. Right? At least some had not. Some not yet. That's okay. Okay, so find some kettlebells.
your elbows up here. Yeah. Back up here? Broad, yeah, broad. Yep, your elbows back into that knee. Keep going, keep traveling, keep traveling, keep traveling. There we go. See your arms shape and your legs shape. Now we know we found it. Yes, sir. Now we stand right up. Yeah. Arm shape, leg shape, then we know. Yes, sir. Push your butt back. Fuck like this. There you go. There we go. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And that engagement, like you just did 20 reps of what you would have done in two reps of the day. Yes, sir. So when we look at actually deadlifting the kettlebell, the whole, the whole purpose is not to mirror the barbell in weight. It's to accompany the barbell in position. It's to accessorize the barbell in position. It's to train the hinge in a variety of weights, in a variety of different weights that all accumulate into the heaviest, safest hinge. If I'm picking up a barbell, I'm trying to lift a car off of somebody. I do that all the time. I kind of do a fun thing in mind. Um, we want to do that the exact same way as we would pick up a barbell or pick up a kettlebell. And so the kettlebells go up to heavy enough to be useful for almost anybody. But that can be heavy enough to be useful for almost anybody if we engage it like we're trying to injure it. So that's going to be the game now. It's not going to be to find the heaviest thing on the fucking floor. We'll do that tomorrow. The game is going to be trying to injure that kettlebell by picking it up and putting it down with so much force and intensity. Good. That being said, don't, don't hurt yourselves trying to do that. <laughs> So the difference would be this, 44 pounds is like half of my one rep max. So if I really focus hard on it, but I don't really pay all that much attention, I can kind of lift it okay. On paper, it looks like a hinge, right? The difference would be something like this. Whereas I just made the exact same shape for the exact same reason with 10 times the intensity and actually got work out of a 44 pound weight. Good, so let's play the second game. Five reps, maybe change weights once or twice. The game is not win the deadlift. The game is work on the hinge. Good? So we'll look at the kind of suitcase deadlift then we'll look at the swing and then we'll move on to the other level change. Suitcase deadlift is really easy for the kettlebells to win. Splitting two really unstable things in half makes them twice as unstable. So the suitcase deadlift is great to teach midline engagement. It's definitely great to teach upper back bracing. And it's great to teach bar patterning. If your hands come off your legs, the bar will also come off your legs. If your hands stay on your legs, then very often will not. So when we're lifting from a suitcase, nothing changes from the primary hinge. That's really kind of the game where it makes it a valuable complement supplement. If someone has a real sticking point on lifting a bar, you get them to lift the suitcase heavy and properly, the bar just gets easier every single time they do it. So we, we engage these things the same way we would anything. Broaden the upper back, drive the knees out, fat belly, and then the hands stay attached to the legs. If I was to turn these handles, what is it exactly doing? It's tracing the path that the bar would need to move in order to keep it safe and attached to my body. In the last 15 or 20 degrees, the suitcase is hard, and that's not that heavy of a weight. I'm not warm for sure, but that last little bit before the floor was tough. So keep that in mind. That's when we keep the fattest, strongest belly. Just like with the bar, you don't disengage here. If you are going to disengage at all, it's not until that thing is clearly past your knees and safe. Most of us have probably made that mistake. Let's not make it so early in the day. So brace, stay there. Good. Just a few reps of this with some type of weights that match. Uh, don't get too ambitious on this, just to teach the pattern. I can carry your feet up a little bit. Yes, sir. That's the reason I do that. I mean, it's the same thing with the band, but I'm just adjusting the command of this. If your feet are wider than the hips, you can't really get your external rotation. So I would put the under your, um, hips under your heels a little bit, and then see if you can get more drive out of the knee, and more shoot your wheels. You've got a great hand, so that's how you get by. Yeah.
variable elimination strategy. If we're doing nine things right and one thing poorly, it's often very sensible to just single out that one thing. Uh, right now, what I see everybody doing is moving their heads around a lot because there's an implement on each side, not simply one in the middle. Prioritize your head neutral. You're walking down the street, you break into a random hinge. <laughs> <laughs> stays exactly the same. Good? Okay, a couple more reps thinking about that. 